What's up guys? A couple weeks ago I built a coffee lake system in the Fantex Evolve Evo Shift right over my shoulder there. So today we're going to take a look at the benchmarks. We'll do the thermals. We'll also do a sound test so you can get a full picture of the kind of performance you will expect from this case and this system. So up first, let's take a look at the CPU benchmarks. Running on liquid cooling, uh, the CPU was able to hit its max speed of 4.3 gigahertz on all cores and maintain that throughout the test. I didn't have any issues with throttling or anything uh, with this H55 cooler. Now let's take a look at the temps. Again, this test got a little bit interesting. You see it idle, hitting 32 degrees, uh, normal there, not nothing to be concerned with. You would think that maybe you could drop into the 20s with liquid cooling, but this case does have restricted airflow, so not too bad there. Uh, gaming, 65, again, normal, probably would look for a little lower in, in, with liquid cooling, but what are you gonna do that's not super bad? Then you get into rendering and 100% load. Rendering is obviously uh, using Adobe products, so that's using Adobe Media Encoder, uh, pushing the GPU. It's usually hovering around 95% to 100%, so that's hitting 90C on liquid, and then 100% load with Prime 95 is hitting 92C. So as you see, this chip does run very hot. I was shocked by how hot it got, especially compared to the older 65 watt TDB chips, the 7700. So be careful of that. This chip does run warm. If you're gonna run the 8700K, you definitely probably wanna think about getting better liquid cooling than the H55. Obviously that's an entry level liquid cooler, uh, but it shouldn't have a problem. I wouldn't think cooling a 65 watt TDP chip, but shockingly, 90C. Sliding over to synthetic GPU test, you got some decent results. Uh, this chip is very good at gaming. Obviously, in a, with a 1070, the 1070 is probably going to be the limiter in terms of the performance here, not the CPU. So I was getting some interesting results, um, but there was a bit of a performance drop, and I will show you why right now. Okay, so here we have the case partially disassembled. Um, nothing going in the back and some of the stuff taken out. Uh, basically, how the GPU is supposed to be installed, you hit it, put it on this bracket here. This is obviously the back plate of the motherboard, and it kind of this snakes through there, and it sits right here, flush up against this top part, and you can kind of slide it on this rail. But it's coming a little tighter, so the GPU rests there. And if we spin it just a little bit, you can kind of see that's the motherboard. That's the GPU. So it's very close. And now this is, there is an exhaust fan that goes right here, pumps cool air over the motherboard and the GPU 140 millimeter exhaust fan, but it does not appear to be uh, putting enough air between this little gap here uh, to cool the GPU completely and keep it from throttling, at least with the compact version that I'm using here. For a full-size GPU with a full-size heatsink, it probably would be better, but in this configuration, not ideal. Now let's take a look at the GPU temps. I've used this GPU in other systems, other compact cases, so I know that it usually doesn't hit above 73C, 75. In this case, I was idling around 51, which is fine. Keeping the fan off, not a big deal. Rendering hitting 75C, that's fine as well. But in gaming, I was hitting 83C and I was getting throttling. As we talked about with the benchmarks before, because the way that the GPU is kind of sandwiched up against the motherboard in the back, it really didn't seem to be getting proper airflow uh, or not enough airflow. And it was hitting its 83C and it was definitely throttling. So I'm getting slightly reduced scores. I tested the GPU outside of the case and I got slightly elevated scores. Uh, so that's something to be cautious about if you're going to build in this case a compact card which I used because I was going to do some advanced water cooling in there uh, that's not really the best choice you're going to want to use a full-length GPU or a water cooled GPU liquid cooled uh, that will eliminate that kind of issue but I did see a slight drop in performance from this slight throttling that was occurring a lot of you out there questioned my decision to go with a Corsair SF450 for this build, saying it wasn't powerful or beefy enough to handle the load. But people, it is important to note that real world power draw is much different from TDP or suggested power supply for your components, the graphics card or CPU, and that sort of thing. So let's look at the actual power draw from the wall pulled with my watt meter. As you can see, the system 
I couldn't get it to peak over 300 watts. I tried, I was running Furmark and Prime 95 at the same time while doing Crystal Dismark, and I could not get it to go above 390, around 398. I think that was, I'm sorry, 298. I think that was the absolute peak, but it was hovering at the, under those test conditions at around 390. Uh, so it, it's obviously plenty of headroom there. If you're gonna get components, make sure you, you factor in the real world TDP so you're not over purchasing, buying a thousand watt power supply for a system that just doesn't need it. Acoustics are very important, especially if you are sitting fairly close to your computer, you want it to be as quiet as possible. I was anticipating this case being rather quiet and generally speaking, it is okay. We'll take a look at the idle and then we'll do gaming and full 100% load noise test. So as you hear, under idle conditions or gaming conditions, it's acceptable, not too bad. It's rather quiet, actually. You can play games, no problem. But if you're gonna use applications that push it to 100% low, like rendering on the CPU, stuff like that, that's where you get a problem. And it is a rather loud case. Now, I'm guessing if you use dual RADs in here, maybe a thicker RAD, um, it might be a little bit better. But with this kind of setup that I have, it got very loud because the fan had to ramp up um, a lot when you were hitting load on the CPU. So just something to be uh, aware of. I learned quite a bit about this case and these components, obviously from doing a build and running all sorts of benchmarks in it. Top things that I learned, one, Coffee Lake runs hot. So 65 watt TDP is still running very hot and pulling a lot more power than the old 65 watts. No real surprise there. It's six cores, same architecture essentially. You're gonna see an uh, increase in power draw. That's not surprising, but it was surprising to see how hot uh, the chips actually ran, especially in comparison to old Ryzen chips. The second thing I picked up is that the Fantex Evolved Evo Shift is not the best case from a performance standpoint. Uh, it's a good case. Visually, it looks awesome. I mean, one of the more attractive looking cases that I've seen in, in recent years. But in terms of performance, uh, eking out top level performance from your components, you probably wanna look elsewhere at cases with better airflow and better positioning. If you go with a full size GPU, I'm guessing you will see slightly better temperatures. Obviously bigger heat sinks should help out a lot, um, but just the way that the, the case is positioned and the way that the GPU is kind of sandwiched up against the motherboard, it does create issues with temperatures as you saw earlier. And the third thing, this just made me miss small form factor PC cases. This is why I like small form factor cases. You get a giant case like the Shift that takes up a decent amount of space and it looks cool, but the performance is not there. I put all the same components from that system, minus the water cooling, into my Laser LZ7 and it actually performs better. Uh, the GPU no longer hits over 80 degrees. There's no more throttling and the CPU is obviously still going to be around the same, but the load temperatures are lower with a cheaper and smaller air cooler on there. So it's, it's much better and quieter in a tinier box, which I know is counterintuitive, but these days, uh, the small factor cases are awesome and that's why I usually build in them because they're small, they're compact, they look cool and they don't come with a lot of the headaches that larger cases tend to come with. So overall it's a cool system and it looks good but I don't think I'm going to keep it as my daily driver because of the limitations with the GPU performance and some of the heat issues with the CPU. I'm probably going to be throwing my Ryzen 1700 in there uh, and converting that into either a streaming PC or a home theater PC with the case like it's supposed to be used for uh, and just, you know, just having it there for that and not everyday use rendering all that fun stuff. Uh, it's just a little too loud and a little too large and cumbersome for me. But as always, thanks for watching guys. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you like the video. I'll drop links below for everything you saw in the video today, all the components of the build, as well as a link to the full article on the website. If you wanna check that out, you can as well. I'm Jay, this is Tech Everything. I'll see you next time.